Welcome, uh, Faith Bible Chapel. We're here on uh, another Sunday, uh, July, uh, July, uh, in our dreams, April 5th, 2020. Um, it's a joy to be able to be here, to worship together, even if it's remotely, um, just to celebrate the Lord's Day together. I want to start by uh, reading Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who has made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You and we praise You for this opportunity for us to be together, to worship You, to praise You, to honor You in every aspect, every, every corner of our lives. May we rejoice in Your great love. May we praise You for the name of Jesus May we rest in the assurance and the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for this time together. Bless it. Bless those who are listening. Um, may you be honored through all of this. We praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, before we get going, I do have a few announcements that I want to make. Um, number one, I am not Dan Principe. Um, some of you will know that. Probably most of you. Uh, I'm Chuck Kraske, uh, an elder here at Faith Bible Chapel. And um, Dan, I'm going to give you a little update here. Uh, Dan has been called to active duty in Massachusetts. Um, he actually got a call, I believe it was on Friday, and that he needed to be down in, in Massachusetts um, serving at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. Um, so... Uh, he's down there right now. Um, I'll just read a few things here. Uh, his activities are related to the current uh, COVID situation in Massachusetts. And I can't go into detail or, uh, of what he's actually doing down there. But suffice it to know that he's serving his country and he's serving the community where he's located right now. Um, there'll be more information coming along uh, as we go along. Um, but the duration of Dan's uh, service down there in Massachusetts, Massachusetts could be anything from a couple of days uh, to something that is significantly longer than that. The bottom line is we just don't know yet. Um, Dan and the leadership team are in communication, and we will be continuing to adapt and, and adjust and plan um, as the whole situation develops. Um, so we'll keep you informed. We'll get information out there as we are able to. Um, but be praying for Dan. Be praying for Cherish and the family as, and, uh, as we go through this, this time of transition, this time of trial, this time of unknown and uncertainty. Um, so anyway, and praise God that we, have a, that we have a pastor who not only serves us, but he's serving his country in the, in the larger community in general. Um, that's something that we, again, can be thankful for and lifting him up in prayer. Okay, a couple of other things. As Dan announced earlier, uh, we will not be having service for another couple of weeks, uh, this week and next week for certain. Um, so we're going to be taking it one step at a time. Kind of every two weeks we'll, we'll determine where we are with the, uh, with the current situation, um, with developments within our state, Ultimately, trusting in God to, to guide us as, as we seek to protect um, the health of our congregation and the health of our community. Um, we're pulling together uh, an updated list uh, of, uh, of the uh, congregation, of the members of Faith Bible Chapel and, and the folks who are here, um, way, contact information so that we can communicate not just by Facebook, not just by the internet, um, 
but also by emails, by phone calls. Um, the big thing, and Dan, this is reiterating what Dan said the other night, let's keep track of one another. Uh, this is a time when we can really be our brother's keeper. Through phone calls, through identifying needs and passing those needs along to others that we can uh, try to address them and make sure everybody's safe and everybody's healthy uh, to the best of our ability and, and relying in God's uh, faithfulness with all of this. Um, and finally, you know, just a reminder to let your leadership team know of any issues that you see developing, any pending issues. Um, primarily right now, for the time being, you know, I may be the point contact, um, but then also Roland and Don, um, and we can, we can spread out from there. Okay, uh, lastly, today is communion day. We're not going to be doing that. Um, but take a moment at home. Take a moment quietly with, with your family to remember what Christ has done, to celebrate your own little mini communion with a piece of bread, a cup of water, or a cup of juice, remembering what Christ has done, His life, His death, His resurrection, the bo broken body and the shed blood, all for us, for the forgiveness of sin. And let's rejoice in that and give thanks in it. Okay, um, moving on. This is not going to be a typical Palm Sunday uh, service, type of service, um, where we celebrate Christ's triumphal, em triumphal entry into Jerusalem prior to His arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection. But we are going to talk of God's goodness and His enduring love. God's goodness and His, his enduring love which are ultimately demonstrated by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And through His work, God's redemption of His children. Let's pray. Father God, thank You again for this opportunity for us to, to join together in worship. Bless each of those who are listening today. May You speak to them through Your Word. Guide me as I speak for clarity, clarity of of thought and word in a way that is pleasing and honoring to you. Father, bless this day, bless this service, bless your children, and may all glory and honor and praise be given to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Okay, um, today we're going to read, we're going to be talking from uh, basically, I'm going to be going over Psalm 107. Uh, this is a psalm, I don't know, that for the past year has really struck me, uh, really just has been on my mind, on my heart a lot. Um, so I'm going to read it. It's a, it's a little bit lengthy, so bear with me. Um, but it's Psalm 107. It goes like this. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those He redeemed from the hand of the foe, those He gathered from the lands, from the east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. For He satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness and the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains. For they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction 
because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Others went out on sea, on the sea in ships, and they were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest and then lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm. He guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. He turned rivers into a desert, flowing springs into thirsty ground, and fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who lived there. He turned the desert into pools of water and parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live, and they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields and planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them, and their numbers greatly increased, and he did not let their herds diminish. Then their numbers decreased, and they were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow. He who pours contempt on nobles made them wander in, the track, in a trackless waste. But he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased their families like flocks. The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked shut their mouths. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. Okay. Okay. Um, there are a couple of key points to listen for uh, in Psalm 107. Okay, a couple of key overriding points. The first one being that God rescues people in various states of trouble or distress. So he's, God is in the business of rescuing us. Okay? Um, but then number two is that God's rescuing activity is grounded in his unfailing love. If you read through Psalm 107, and please, read through it not just once, not just twice. Do it for a while. Do it every day for a week. But as you read through that, notice the number of times that God talks about His unfailing love. It's something for us to consider, something that in today's world we just keep losing sight of. It's awfully easy for it to get washed out in all the noise of everything else that, uh, that we see and hear on the news or in the newspaper or on our phones or whatever they are. But contemplate on that unfailing love that God has for us. Okay, so digging a little deeper into Psalm 107. There are essentially four parts. The first part... Um, is a confession of God's faithfulness. And I'm just going to give you a rundown of those four different parts, and then we'll dig into each one a little bit more deeply. Okay, so the first one is a confession of God's faithfulness. The second part is God's rescue of people, examples of God's rescue of people. And there were several different situations. So wandering in the wilderness, those who were trapped in darkness and gloom, those who have become fools through rebellious ways, and then people who are venturing out in life in pursuit of earnings or fortune. Um, these are all conditions that we find ourselves in on a daily basis. Okay, the third part then is God's amazing power to change conditions 
coupled with a reminder for us to humbly follow him. And then fourth is a call to wisdom in remembering who God is and how he loves us. So let's go back to number one, the confession of God's faithfulness. So if you look, okay, verses one through three, this is what I'm referring to as the, as, as the confession. It reminds us here, we are confessing that God is good. And God is good specifically because of his love and coming out of his love, his mercy for us or towards us and his grace to us. So God's love and his mercy and his grace. God is good. And then there's also the reminder there that his love endures forever. His love endures forever. On day one, I might love my job. On day five, I might hate my job. At, you know, in relationships, we will find that our loves wanes hot and cold. It goes back and forth. You know, our kids, some days will think we're the best thing since sliced bread. The next day, they may despise us because of something that we have done to try to correct or teach them. But God's love, so it's, it, love can be, in popular terms, love can be fickle, especially when practiced by us. But in God's terms, and in God's reality, love, His love, endures forever. Um, more so, you know, we often consider God to be a rock, the rock upon which we stand. And that is true, but it, you know, even as you look at rocks, rocks, if you look at a river, you know, a Scrooge Falls up in Newry, you'll see as water runs over those rocks over years and years, even that rock wears slightly, and you can see pools where another rock got in there into a depression, and it started rumbling around and rolling around, and it just eroded out what ends up becoming almost a circular or... or uh, spherical hole in a piece of granite god's love and god is so much stronger even than that though you know there there is no depression there is no hole that gets chewed in god's love it endures forever despite the wind the rain erosion all of the other stuff that goes on god's love endures forever and furthermore he has redeemed his people he calls them from all corners of the earth, from north, south, east, and west, from all conditions and all situations. God has rescued us. So we confess this, we rejoice in it, we give thanks in it. We keep coming back to that. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good and His love endures forever. So now we're going to jump into some of those examples that God cites in Psalm 107. As ex you know, examples for us of conditions that people are pulled from, rescued from, that demonstrates God's unfailing love. So the first one, okay, wandering in desert wastelands in the wilderness. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. Sometimes we romanticize this, and I think of the fact um, my sons, Jake, Rick, and I, think there would probably be nothing better than to be stuck in the wilderness, to go out in the wilderness and live off the land for who knows how long. You know, and, and there are a lot of people like us. It just seems like the cool thing to do. But that's a romanticized vision of what the wilderness or what this wasteland is. What God is talking about here is not a fun place to go camping and hiking and, and to go fishing and hunting. But it is a wasteland, a deserted area where there is no home. There is no food. There is no drink. It's desolation. You're lost. Um, and, and wandering. You know, you don't wander in the desert just for the fun of it. Um, you know, we find ourselves in this condition or in these, this wasteland condition in many different ways. 
Okay, we may not have a job. Um, is you know that whole thought process of is this what I am supposed to be doing? I'm going from job to job, or my job seems like a dead end job. What in the world am I doing here? What is my role? Is what I am doing is the life that I'm leading? Does it even matter? All of those are situations that are kind of similar to that being in that deserted wasteland. Um, it's easy, as we get into these other situations I've just talked about, it's easy to find ourselves wandering, lost, struggling, essentially dissatisfied with everything. Um, and we never rest. Our life is in turmoil, our minds are in turmoil, our hearts are in turmoil, and we never rest. But, what happens? Okay, in verse 6, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. God delivers them. He brings them out to a home, to a place where they can rest. He provides for them what they need. He satisfies the thirsty. He satisfies their thirst. He, sat, he fills the hunger. All because of His unfailing love. If God does that and has done that for the people in the desert. He can do that for us through His unfailing love. Okay, the second example. Sitting in darkest, darkness and deepest gloom. Okay, so if you read verse 10. Some sat in darkness and the deepest gloom. Prisoners suffering in iron chains. For they had rebelled against the word of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. They were suffering as a prisoner. And in one of the commentaries that I read, it's important to remember that in, the, in ancient days, okay, prisons were often pits that were dug and covered over, or, or dungeons, deep dungeons, in the base of a tower or something. No light, no communication, darkness, misery, gloom, okay? That's what these folks were in. And why? Because they had rebelled against God's Word. They had rebelled against what He had taught. They had rebelled against what He had commanded. Okay? They had turned and gone out on their own. And so they were trapped in bitter labor with no rest. They were caught up in despair. So, sin often brings us to this point. As we turn away from God, as we start to fall away from His Word, as we fall away from fellowship with others, as we turn away and turn our backs on Him, we can find ourselves in that spot where we are isolated. There's no one there to help. Okay? We find ourselves in despair, um, feeling lost, and then as a result of that, feeling bitter, flat out miserable. Okay, but then again, as call as as spelled out in Psalm 107, the folks who were in this condition cried out to God. They recognized that they couldn't redeem themselves; that they were needy; that they needed God, and they cried out to Him, and He saves. Okay, He broke away. And breaks away the darkness and the gloom. He brings light into our lives. Purpose, meaning, joy. He pulls us out of the pit. And breaks away the chains. No prison. Figurative or literal. Is too strong to withstand God's power. And all because of God's unfailing love for us. Okay, the next one, the next example again, or the next life condition, is becoming fools. And this is similar to the one that we just talked about, this, the, uh, the despair and the gloom, but it's, man, it's a result of sin, as was the example that we just talked about, 
but it's manifested in a different way. So if we look here in verse 17, some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. Okay, so they became fools due to rebellion from God, turning away from God. So you compare that with the last one, which was, I went into, I'm, I sinned, I turned away from God, and I found myself in despair and gloom and isolated. In this case, implementation of, of sin in that person's life results in that foolish rebellion, in walking away from God. Not gloom and despair, but turning and walking away. The thought that, you know what? I know better than God, and my ways are the ways that are right. Forget God. My ways are the ways that are right. And we go off and we live in happy oblivion. Not you know, being oblivious to the consequences of our sin, at least initially. And in this case, it brought affliction, and it brought the people to near death. Okay? Now, we see this in our general society often. Um, and often we let these societal conditions or, or thoughts work their ways into our own lives. Things like, you know, the whole concept that it's got to be me first. I've got to serve myself first and take care of myself. I'm number one. I need to do what I want. Okay? That's the most important thing is for me to do what I want. Um, and you know what? The truth is in me. That's where the truth is. You know, I know what's best for me. Follow your heart. All of these things end up pulling the focus onto ourselves and away from what God teaches us, which is to follow Him, to love Him, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And it leads to trouble, and it leads to death. But, Again, in Psalm 107, it talks about how from their deathbed, these folks called out to God for help. They recognized that they could not do it. They were near death. They could not save themselves. And God saved them from their distress. Just a quick note on that. Listen to how he, how he says that. In verses 19 and 20, they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them from their distress. He sent forth His word and healed them and rescued them from the grave. He sent forth His word. So often we turn from God's word, we turn from His, the ultimate word, Jesus Christ, to go off on our own path. We need to humble ourselves and instead rest in the fact that God knows best. Um, so we give thanks. He's healed them. He's rescued them. God commands them, give thanks again for His unfailing love and tell of it. Don't just keep it to yourself. Tell of it. Okay? It, again, in... Uh, verses 21. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings. Sacrifice thank offerings. Okay? Not just words, but deeds. True love. Demonstration of true love. And tell of His works with songs of joy. This is something, God's unfailing love is something that we can be joyful about. Okay, lastly, the merchants on the sea. Um, we're all there, okay? We're out in the sea of life, if you will, trying to figure out our way, trying to, uh, seeking our call, how are we going to live? How are we going to provide for our families? Um, in some cases, people take it to the extreme. How am I going to you know, find my fortune? 
if you get to that point. And in this case, God tells us of being on the sea. All right, so let's just read through that one last time. Others went out on the sea in ships, and they were merchants on the mighty waters. Okay? But that's where we are often. Going out into the vast unknown or the vast life that faces us. And in this case, he says, these people saw the wonders of God's creation. You think of it. They're out there on the ocean. They see the sunrise, the sunset. They see the storms blow up or the clouds blow in. They see the creatures of the sea, whether it's porpoises or whales or seals or whatever they may see. They see the wonder of God's creation. It's before them all the time. But then they see the awesome power of God in the storm. And they talk about the size of the waves, that they have huge waves. Waves that go up to the heavens or down to the depths. And that they were scared. You know, with that trials, with, those, with, with the storm, the power of that storm, or in our lives, the power of trials or challenging situations, we become fearful. We become scared. And if you've ever been on a ship in any, or a boat in any sort of storm, the way that thing, the way the, the, the ship shifts back and forth and back and forth, you lose your footing. It's hard to stand upright. You stumble back and forth and it becomes scary. Two examples. My dad and I used to go, he had a boat. And there was once we, uh, we went from Bucksport, we, the bo boat was moored in Bucksport, and we were going to go fishing out on the ocean, Seal Island. And it was a little windy inland, and this was a 23-foot boat. And, you know, us being a couple of knuckleheads, we figured no big deal. So we head out Penobscot Bay, and we get out to Vinyl Haven. You know, we're pounding up and down. No big deal. It's a little bit hairy. There aren't many lobster boats out on the bay that day, which is an indication that maybe we shouldn't have been. But as we continue out towards Seal Island, we were in a boat that had a canopy, good stable boat. We would go down, and you'd look up, you'd go down into the trough of a wave, and you'd look up, and that wave, it was probably about a 10-foot wave with a 5-foot swell on top, or 10-foot swell with like a, a wind-blown 5-foot wave on top of that. So we're talking about 15 feet. And there were several times when you hit that trough, and the wave and the water would go right over the top of the boat. That was a pretty hairy feeling, and it was pretty scary. I was driving, and I tell you, I had to pry my hands off of the steering wheel when we were all done. Uh, I don't know what my dad was doing, because I didn't dare take my, head off, my eyes off of what we, where we were going. But it was a strange feeling, because you knew it wasn't going to stop. That those waves were just going to keep coming, and coming, and coming. And it was scary. It was really, truly scary. God provided for us. Things calmed down. And we didn't catch anything that day. But that was part of our life for fishing. Anyway, we came back. And my uncle, who had spent many years boating on the ocean, basically said, you guys were nuts. You were crazy. Never should have been out there in the first place. But the point to that is, I'll never do it again. And point number two is that just with those waves, to know they weren't stopping and there was no turning back, it was scary. But then furthermore, you know, you think that was us in our little boat. Well, there was one time the boys and I went down on a Cub Scout thing to tour the USS Massachusetts, which was a World War II era battleship. And as we went down there, we spent the night on the ship, and we got to meet and talk with some of the people who had been on that ship during World War II. And one kid asked him, you know, what was the, 
scariest time that you ever faced. And he said, the scariest time was when a typhoon blew up in the sea, in the Philippine Sea. And he said, there were waves that were 100 feet tall. And they were on this battleship, and the waves were so large. You know, if, if you picture a World War II battleship, they're huge. And then you have the uh, superstructure, which extend off the deck of the ship probably 80 feet. And he said, there were waves coming that the bow would make, break through the wave, but the wave itself would smash into the highest point of the ship. And to be going pitching up and down with that, and again, you can't get out of it. You can't just turn it off. You're there. That's what life is like sometimes. The pitching, the rolling, knowing that that storm seems like it's going to go on forever. And there's no way, no easy way to get to that place of safety. It caused these sailors, discussed in Psalm 107, it caused them to lose hope. They, they had no courage. They, tr they trembled. They staggered on the deck. Um, their lives were filled with fear. And yet, what did they do? They called out and they cried out to God. And He brought them out of their distress. He brought them out of the storm. He stilled the storm by His Word. That harkens back to, to Matthew chapter 8 where Christ was in the same situation. They were, the, he and the disciples were in the, the raging storm out on the Sea of Galilee, and He was asleep. The disciples cried out to Him, and He calmed the storm with a simple word. That's the power of God. The sailors became glad, and God, God brought them safely to their destination. And God tells them, praise Me, in the assembly, okay? Let them exalt Him in the assembly of the peoples and praise Him in the council of the elders. Give thanks to God as He brings us out of these trials, out of these dangerous, scary, unbelievable times. He will. He will bring us safely to our destination. Rest in Him, trust Him, and praise Him for that unfailing love. The last point is God's amazing power to change conditions. Okay, so again, if we go back and we look in verses 33, He turned rivers into a desert, flowing springs into thirsty ground, fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who lived there. Okay? The result of our sin, the result of our greedy ways, has they have consequences. Alternatively, okay, alternatively, God is fully capable of reversing those situations. He can turn the desert to water, the parched ground to flowing springs. He provides food and safety for us. God has brought hope out of despair, life out of death, safety out of danger. Because He is good and His love endures forever. He lifts the needy out of, out of affliction. And those who have rested in God for their strength, their courage, their wisdom, they recognize it in that they can't do it alone. They are needy. They need God. And they call out to Him. Let us be that people. The people who need God, who call out to Him and rest in Him. Psalm 107 closes with that short little verse. Calling us to wisdom. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things. And consider the great love of the Lord. Let me say that again. Let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. Look back in your life and consider. Take time to contemplate. 
take that time to be quiet and to remember the amazing and unfailing love of God. Be willing to cry out. Be humble enough to cry out. And let God work in that condition in your life that you find yourself in. Remember how God can bring great change and reversals in our lives. And remember that ultimately God has done this for us through the amazing work, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So in, in it all, remember God's goodness and remember God's unfailing love. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your goodness, Lord, and for your unfailing love. In these challenging times that we face, in these uncertain times, whether it's uncertainty with our job, with our health, with the care of our loved ones, with the restrictions and travel and all that we're under, Lord, help us not to forget your unfailing love. Help us to call out to you, to rest in you, and to share the love that you have blessed us with, the love that you have encouraged us with, the love that you have redeemed us with. May we share that with each other, with our families, with our congregation, with the community around us in whatever way we can. And may we praise your holy name, for you are the God most high, and you hold us in your hands. Thank you, Father. Praise you. Bless, bless Dan again as, as he's in Massachusetts. Care for his family as they're here. May your congregation be lifted up to you, Lord, and may we praise your holy name. It's in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Folks, have a good week, and uh, you'll be hearing more from us soon. Take care.